Thank you, John. Yeah, so um, thanks for the invite and allowing me the opportunity to speak to you all here today. So I'm going to give a talk in, um, about this generalized mixed volume of a polynomial system. And the idea of where this comes from is that oftentimes in, in practice, uh, the, these systems that come to us from practice and in applications, they're, they're actually, there's a lot more inherent structure than we normally would, um, would see and that we would, we would look at. And so what we're going to do here is give a little outline of, of this, so I'll give a little background of this talk. Um, some motivation, give a definition for our generalized mixed volume, some examples, and then at the end some open questions, and I hope that you guys all have some questions for me as well. So first thing that we that we we're going to start off with is this uh, this BKK bound, the Bernstein Kuznerko Kovansky bound, and what is this? This is whenever we have some polynomial system and we have generic coefficients for everything, well, we're going to end up with the same number of uh, complex solutions for any any choice of our any random choice of our, our of our coefficients. And so what this ends up is that there's this wonderful theorem by, uh, by, by, those, by these three wonderful guys, Bernstein, Kowalski, and, and Kushner, who, who say that, hey, look, this is really the same thing as the mixed volume of, um, of, of a polynomial system. And the, the sense of this mixed volume is uh, in the sense of this, these, these new and polytopes of a, of a polynomial. So we take the, if we take some polynomial f and we look at the convex hull of this guy, this is going to be our um, convex body, and now we can go ahead and, and do all of our wonderful Minkowski sums, and then go ahead and find this this canonical mixed volume. So here's here's our wonderful definition. It's long drawn out. I'm not going to go terribly too much into detail. Just this exists, and what we're going to try to do, is, as far as what we're really considering, is how this generalizes to this uh, to polynomials. So as, as far as we're going to be concerned in this talk is when I, when I talk about mixed volume, I'm really just going to be talking about, well, for, as far as a, uh, the mixed volume of a polynomial system, what's the number of isolated solutions that we're going to have for generic coefficients? And we'll see how this can, hopefully, we, we can try to understand how the structure that we have from these problems that come from industry and from practice how we can keep this structure and, and generalize this notion of, of mixed volume. Okay, so let's start with a motivating example. So we have a, a structured polynomial system from C into CN, and it's this guy here. And so what's the first thing that we can say about this guy? We have some nice repeated sub-expressions that occur in this, and if we go ahead and use whatever favorite uh, polynomial continuation solver that we want, we find that we end up with a root count of two. But if we go ahead and expand this guy out and then go ahead and choose generic coefficients for, for all of our monomial terms here, what ends up happening is that we get a actual root count of four. So our mixed volume for this system um, is actually four. But we actually have a root count of two. So we really want to understand how does this extra structure play a role. Okay. So what, what do our current methods do? Our current methods are just construct a homotopy, and we just go ahead and uh, we could use any number of ways to construct a start system. So we start off with some, some start system g of z, and we move to f of z. And the idea is that we can use total degree, some multi-homogeneous, maybe a linear product uh, or polyhedral methods. So pick your favorite method, it doesn't matter. But the, the downside with all of these methods are that they really don't take into account this extra structure here. So even with polyhedral methods, we'll, we'll, we'll track or we'll follow four paths, but we still end up with two extraneous paths. So we, we still, in, in some sense, we, we, we're, we're doing some extra work, and we want to try to reduce this. At the very least, what we're going to do is try to understand what's, what's going on here. And so this is our just a, a, a continuation picture where we just have our start solutions of our start system. We just choose any, you know, you don't have to do Euler prediction, choose your favorite predictor method, and then just do multivariate Newton, and just follow these homotopy paths all the way to our 
the target solutions of our, of our target system. Okay. And so what do we mean when we're, we're saying we want to try to identify structure? Well, what is this? This is really, first of all, it's very difficult to know, you know sort of ahead of time. Second of all, it really just boils down to some additional algebraic relationship on our coefficients. And essentially what this means is that our coefficients vanish on our discriminant. Okay. And it's really difficult to compute the actual discriminant variety. I mean, I actually went ahead and for the, our, our, actually we'll come back to that example. For that, uh, for that little guy that I, that, that I had, just that bivariate system, uh, I, was, I was trying to get the discriminant and I mean, I stopped it after two hours. I just didn't want to wait longer than that. So it's, to, to me, this is difficult, right? I mean, we couldn't get it right away. And you know, so, sort of we, we know that there's some extra structure going on with that particular system. And so a lot of times, some, these systems that, that come from practice and from industry, they really have this, this identifiable structure. And they're really given to us with this structure sort of intact. So we, you know, we're, we're given some problem from industry, and we really say, oh, hey, look. We can recognize that this structure already exists. So as an example, we have um, a serial link robot. And the idea is that we have some joints. And we want to we wanna know that, say we have, um, actually what we'll see is this is just a, an, an example of a picture with um, two links. So we have the i minus 1 link and the i link. And the idea is that we have a whole bunch of different parameters, say the lengths of these links, the distance offset of the joints, some angles uh, associated with the twists, and then some position values for where our joints are located. And the, the idea is that this just encapsulates at least two of the links. And we can go ahead and generalize this to six links. And if we do so, then we end up with this system of polynomials, uh, system of polynomials where we have some spherical constraints, some, uh, some twisting uh, constraints, and then finally we have some position constraints. And what's surprising about this guy is that we actually have a, uh, if we choose, if we go ahead and multiply everything out, choose generic coefficients for our, for our system, then we'll end up with 288 isolated solutions. But for a random choice of our, of our parameters, these distances for the links and distance for the offsets of our joints and for and for the the options these these uh these angles for our our twist angles then this this we're going to end up with only 16 solutions so really we have a lot of extra structure that we're we're really missing out when we're we're looking at this this is sort of a, a nice great example that comes from from practice okay. so let's go back to our motivating example and well, I mean, we, we sort of look at this and what's the first thing that we can say? Well, the first thing that we can say is that we have this repeated expression, this x1 plus 1, you know, and he's squared. But we have this x1 plus 1. He, he's reoccurring several times in our, in, our, in our polynomial system. And what can we do now with this is that, well, let's maybe just do a, um, create a new variable. And let's just say y1 is just x1 plus 1. That's all, all we're doing. We're going to call this guy a replacement variable. And we're going to replace our replacement variable every time we see x1 plus 1 into our, new, into our original system. And then introduce a third equation that defines this replacement scheme. And so we're going to call this, oh, well, first of all, this, is, uh, this has a mixed volume of two. We actually go ahead and choose generic coefficients for everything. We actually do get our nice isolated, uh, the number of isolated solutions is two, which corresponds to the number of isolated solutions of our original system. Okay. And what we're going to say is that this process of transforming this, this f here into this f tilde is going to be our replacement algorithm. So anytime I say replacement or, or replacement scheme, by this, I mean whatever choice that we have of some sub-expressions and the corresponding replacement variables. And uh, we will take our original system and replace the corresponding sub-expressions with the corresponding replacement variable, and then introduce new equations 
that define that additional relationship. Yes? But you're counting a different thing. You're not counting the number it, of solutions. Yes, yes. So this is, this, is, this is true. But under an appropriate projection, so if we project off of the Ys, right, we get our original system back, and we'll have the same yes, number. F3 is only linear. Yeah. Yeah, and, and because F3 is only linear. But so about saying you're counting solutions that are not when the variables are zero, right? I mean, Sorry. The PKK bound like, only counts solutions on the torus, right? Yes, 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 yes. So you don't have solutions on X or Y. Because you have a constant term here. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. Because of this extra constant term. Yeah, OK. Yeah, OK. Well, all right. In this example, why don't you just replace y1 squared instead of y1? You could have done that. Then you have to count yeah. the, the, then, you, then you get an extra um, uh, here. You guys, you'll, you'll end up with a square here for that guy. So, but 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 this is okay. We'll 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 get to that here, and we'll we'll get to this this the, this. That's a good question. Good point. We'll get to that here shortly. Um, but an observation that we want to uh, um, point out is that we can take any polynomial system, and we can rewrite in a new system using this a, any type of replacement scheme. So if we have r different sub-expressions that we want to replace, we can rewrite our our system f as f tilde and say that we have m prime here is going to be the uh, so some monomial vector in the original variables and also in the um, new replacement variables. And then b is just some constant um, vector. And then y is our replacement variable. c is just some coefficient vector that comes from our original system, the appropriate replacement values. And m is just now the corresponding monomials that occur in our replacement scheme. And so we're going to have two different types of replacements. We're going to end up with what's called this <laughs> trivial replacement. And this trivial replacement is essentially when we take the original polynomial system and just say, all right, well, one polynomial system, we're going to just replace that entire thing altogether. Okay. And we're going to do that for, for both this. So this, in our, in our example, we, just, we do it like this. These were all the monomial terms that occurred. Here are our replacement variables. And notice we have the identity times some um, the replacement variables here. And this is just the coefficient matrix of our original system. Here's the monomial uh, vector column of our original monomials that appeared. And we just change this into this new replacement guy. Now we have another type of uh, uh, replacement scheme that's called this all monomial replacement. So instead of replacing each polynomial separately, we can just say, all right, well, let's just replace each of the monomials themselves instead. Okay? And well, maybe there's a, uh, and the reason I bring these two guys up is that they're sort of on either of the two extremes. And maybe there's a better replacement, at least with our original guy, our original motivating example, where we just replace the x1 plus 1 with, with that y, y1. Okay. And so what we're going to say our, our generalized mixed volume is, is take, our, take some replacement scheme. We're going to fix, fix this, this algebraic set here. And now, instead of having A being the appropriate um, replacement from our original system, we're going to let A be generic. So we're fixing this guy here, but now we're letting A be generic. And what ends up happening is that the trivial replacement corresponds to the number of isolated roots of F, and it's going to be less than or equal to our, our generalized mixed volume. And the all monomial replacement is actually going to give us a situation where our mixed volume is the same as our generalized mixed volume. Okay. So let's look at an example here. Let's go ahead and say, we, well, we see we have x1 minus 2. We have x2 squared. These, these guys sort of appear several times. And we have a mixed volume of 8 and a root count of 4. And if we choose x1 minus 2 and x2 squared as our replacement sub-expressions. Uh, sub and we let all of our uh, coefficients be generic. What ends up happening is we get a generalized mixed volume of 4. So we're fixing this guy here. This guy is fixed based off of our particular replacement scheme. But now the coefficients that occur from our sort of our original system, these guys are, are generic. 
And so this is, this is what we're really saying. Is, is, this is really what's going on. So by doing this replacement, we're sort of keeping our structure that we had. And now what we're doing is we're randomizing our, our sort of our, our system that we've done this replacement on. So let's look at maybe a, a little bit more, uh, another example. Now, in this last example, notice that each of these two replacement uh, choices, they're sort of um, univariate in, in, in either of them, right? So we just have x1 and x2, these guys are separate. Well, we're, we're not really restricted to that. We can go ahead and do a replacement with um, multiple guys. So notice that we have this guy, this x1 squared minus 2x1, x2 squared plus 3x2 minus 1. He appears several different times with varying powers. But we, we notice now that he's, he's bivariate. So we're, not, we're no longer restricted to this univariate situation that we saw in our, our previous example. And what we're going to see is that we have a mixed volume of 48. So if we go ahead and multiply this all out, choose generic coefficients for everything, we have 48 isolated solutions. And it turns out that for this particular system, we actually have 24, 24 solutions. Okay, so let's, let's choose one particular replacement. We're going to let y, y3 be x1 squared minus 2x1, x2 squared, and just go ahead and replace them everywhere. So notice we didn't do the entire replacement of, of that one sub-expression that occurred everywhere. And what we see is that we end up with this generalized mixed volume of 30. So this generalized mixed volume is really dependent on the choice of our replacement scheme that we've, that we've done. And if we go ahead and, uh, well, we, we're, we're still going to have the same root count that we had from before, the, the 24. So if we go ahead and do this, uh, do this again, but actually do the replacement with the, uh, the entire sub-expression that occurs, we actually do end up with a generalized mixed volume of, of 24. And so it turns out that if we look at, at our, our serial link robot, this, uh, with, with the, the six different links and six different joints, if we choose a replacement scheme where this dot product and these, each of these individual cross product terms, we use, choose a replacement scheme where we let these be our sub-expressions that we replace, we get our generalized mixed volume of 16. So this is, this is nice because here we had something where we had some, some really nice structure and what we've done is kept a hold of that structure by fixing some algebraic set in our replacement scheme and then randomizing sort of the polynomials that we had originally okay. with the replacements plugged in, right? And so the nice thing about this is that this extends to positive dimensional varieties. So we can, we're working on this. Uh, this is joint work with Brent uh, Davis and John Honstein. And there's a lot more details that are going on with this. I'm happy to discuss this uh, later on. And it really, the, the point of this talk was just sort of an introduction of this idea. And so, so we're, we're finishing up um, this paper and, and this should all be included. And so, it's just really important to note that this does actually generalize to this pot to the positive dimensional case. So some questions before you guys all bomb bombard me with your own. Um, some uh, first a note is that if we have more replacement variables, what ends up happening is that we end up with a larger system, you know, that, than we what we started with. So maybe our, our linear solves that we're using um, are going to be not not as quick. So there's, this, there's going to be this trade-off that occurs. So what's a good number of replacement variables that we can choose to actually go ahead and get the, um, to, to have like a, an optimal replacement scheme, all right? And the second question is slightly, slightly different. Um, what's happening is that if we let our, well, all right, so, so we have these, so, so we have this, these systems. And we have some additional structure. And what we want to know is, is there a way to, to, to choose the, the right number, to construct some type of start system that has the exact number of homotopy paths, where we, we, we keep this, 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 uh, this structure and, and are able to track it. But we will, maybe we don't actually want to use replacement because this is going to extend our system, it's going to make it, make it much larger. And 
th there's some really nice results from um, Patrice Philippon and Martin Sombra that look at this in a, this this torque setting, and so it, it's it, to me it seems like there ought to be a way to so so these results that they have they have this this sort of formula to be able to give an exact root count um, whenever you look at one particular variable in in a different coefficient ring, and you look at these sort of viatic Newton polytopes, the, these roof polytopes in this, in this other toric setting, and it ends up that you can sort of reduce your root count by removing some extra points out at infinity. And so the idea here is that maybe we, we ought to be able to use that information and maybe do some type of augmented polyhedral methods to actually have an exact um, number of homotopy paths that we would want to track for these, these structured polynomial systems. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all. And yes. Uh, Maple, for instance, has a command collect. So you could like give a system of polynomials and you could say, oh, I have this variable y, and I want to treat that as the most important variable and look at its coefficients and the other variables. So I could imagine a way that you might get some way of finding a replacement scheme like that. But like the general system of polynomials I hand you, uh, I mean, if I told you the replacement scheme ahead of time, you might have a chance. But how do you find any replacement scheme? You just look at the polynomials by hand? Like, right, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's that's a great question. So this is, I mean, really, really, what ends up happening is that these 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 problems that that were given come from practice. And you know, with that example, with that serial link robot, we actually had those cross product terms and those dot product terms. So, I mean, really, it's it's almost always, at least with with these problems that come from practice, the structure is given to us. I mean, these were just examples that I constructed and we actually knew that they were you know did the computations and knew that they're going to have a deficient uh, BKK uh, root count but yeah that's you know if you're if you have something that's expanded all the way out how would you know what's the what what's a good choice for the replacement scheme there's very difficult yeah Alicia did you have a question? No maybe it's, it's very stupid but <laughs> so you had the you know, system with some structure mm -hmm. So the replacement is, for me, the same thing as just keeping your structure, but putting generic coefficients in what you have. So you can have a star system, any of those. Mm. What, what's new that you're adding to this? I, I don't know how to say. You can use the star system, any system with this structure, but generic coefficients. Mm. What's the difference with what you're doing? So, with, so you're saying that you have your generic system, so, so you have your fixed replacement scheme, and then you have your. Can you go, sorry, yeah. To your yeah, yeah, first, yeah, yeah. Uh, very first example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, sorry, it's a stupid question, but I say if you just you have coefficients one minus five two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead yeah. of those, you put A, B, C, D generic. You put in this structure generic coefficients. Sure. What's the difference? Sure. So if you would go ahead and. Um, choose, yeah, if you let these guys be all, yeah, yeah, so, so if you let these guys be all generic right now, then, I mean, yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's exactly what this replacement scheme is doing, but the current methods and these, like, say, how polyhedral methods are implemented and, and uh, uh, th these actually will expand out everything and then you'll actually end up with the, the, the four extraneous paths. So, even if you, even if we go ahead and choose this right now as such, letting these be all generic, we'll still end up with those extra extraneous paths with the current. Not if you start with one of those. The question that maybe for one of those is not easy to find the solutions. But I mean, if you choose any generic coefficients with this structure and you start with one of those, you have the right number of paths. Yep. Yes. But you will need to solve that. Yep. Yes, precisely. Which is maybe the same as solving this. Yes, that's yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, that's 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 precisely what you're saying. Correct. Yeah. Go ahead. How, how do you know that the new system has a smaller mixed volume? In other words, how do you know that the generalized mixed volume is always smaller than mixed volume? Uh uh in that, that one this slide here with this 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 guy or uh, with the trivial replacement? Because we're doing a randomization here, so then all that, all that we're saying is by some Bertini randomization theorem, we might increase the number of solutions. So what ends up happening is that the, uh, the number of solutions that we have here, right, 
with with this guy with this trivial replacement might might increase it whenever we generalize the, these particular coefficients with this fixed scheme. So the in, in our system that we had originally, we might have even more special coefficients, and they, they may not all be generic. I mean, that was a great example with this this example too. Here is that in this particular replacement, we actually don't have. Um, if we go ahead and choose everything to be generic now, right? What ends up happening is that we we still didn't get that additional structure with these guys here, and that, that wasn't included in our in our replacement scheme. So that was why we had that mix, the generalized mixed volume of 30, but still had our root count of 24. So in that transparency, these are, these were not minuses. Can you show that back again? Yeah, there's something oh. there. If I generalize mixed okay. volume, it's actually equal. I thought it was minus. No. Where? Here? No. No. Oh, my. It's a dash. Yes, yeah, it's a okay. dash. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. When, I see. when you compare M3 right and two, that's yeah. dashes. These are, these are two cases, right? Oh. That's oh. This is this is a dash, not a minus. Yeah, there, yeah. I'm sorry. This is this is a dash. It should be like dash dash, or something like to indicate not being a. So, so you are not certain that always the GMV so will be smaller than the MV of the original. Well, right. This here, yeah, 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 yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Sorry. So I, I mean, what's the theorem here, and what's the geometry that's behind it? I mean, I saw. I mean, I'm sorry. I saw some examples. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what generalized mixed volume is, and I don't know what okay. I mean, it's generalized mixed volume, the mixed volume of, of, this, of this replacement system. What's, what's the geometry behind right. it? Right. So the, the geometry is we're fixing this guy we're, we're with specific no, no, no. and special what's coefficients. Happening? What's, what's happening here? I mean, I see some algorithms, but what's happening? Okay. Yeah, so what's really happening is that with this generalized mixed volume, we're, we're really trying to keep a hold of that additional structure that we had from, from before. So, 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 so what do you mean by additional structure? I mean, so, there are a number of statements here that are not very clear. Like what's right. So by additional structure, some type of sub-expression that occurs repetitively in, in the polynomial system. That's one example of, a, of some structure. I can, I can clarify. Uh, you can assume you have a linear space of polynomials from, say, C star n. Then you get the mixed volume. Uh, you can restrict your roots to a certain uh, algebraic variety mm-hmm. know, while keeping a linear space of functions. Then you get the Kavehovansky bound. Mm-hmm. But you may also think that your polynomials lay on a variety. Mm-hmm. And then there will be a generic number of roots. And I think this is the is that, general line. Yeah, so this. I'm asking him. Right. Yeah, so that, I mean that, that's I mean that's that's the idea, right? Is that the what's happening is that we're we're fixing this guy, and after we fix this, we let this guy be generic, and the whole point is that the number of isolated solutions that we end up here at the end of the day for this particular solution, we haven't let these guys be all generic. We're we're fixing these to some specialized space, right? So we have some fixed algebraic uh, variety that we're, we're setting this guy to be. And then after that, we're hitting it with some other space. And this other space, in a sense, is this generic space. So what happens when he's likely, I think, because I've done it also in some examples, is that you remove roots at toric infinity. Yes. So the reason that your mixed volume is not equal to the true number of roots is that you have roots at toric infinity. Right. But in some of his examples, there's an affine transformation which reduces it to something which has the correct mixed volume. So he's somehow, somehow looking at the monomials in a different way. But I don't know what you're... When he puts in y, y, y1 instead of x1 plus 1, what happens is that some roots at toric infinity will not show up. I, I, and then the transformation is linear and you have a one-to-one. So, um, that's Maurice? Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, it would be very nice to see some settings where you can actually find this uh, this transformation in polynomial time. I mean, do you think maybe in, in certain fixed number of variables or in certain restricted settings you can actually get some kind of a, a solid theorem in this direction? Yeah, where you can actually say that this is this replacement and then actually be able to get well, the... Find the replacement. In other words, for these kinds of guys, I can find the replacement reasonably fast. So something like that. Yeah, this is related to what Luke had sort of asked initially is how do we, you know, if you're given something and it's all expanded out, how do you even know what a good replacement because choice is? One variable is already kind of subtle. So in one variable, there's actually some interesting work on shifted sparse stuff. So if you have a polynomial and it looks really, really big, uh, you can actually ask, okay, is it a shifted sparse polynomial? Is it a, parse, is, is it a sparse polynomial infected with a shift? 
And there's actually algorithms for doing that in polynomial time. Oh, really? Yeah, there are. Okay, there's I did not know this. There's 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 and, so, and it's, it's also reminiscent of other work. This is work by Felipe Castro. So if you have a polynomial and you want to know its composition of other polynomials, mm -hmm. then uh, there's actually a way to find what the composition was in polynomial time. I think oh. over finite fields. But it seems like what you're trying to do is do, it, do this in, in more variables. And that, that seems rather hard. So the first thing to do would be to find some nice setting where you can do things in polynomial time and see when, when can you do this quickly. Yeah, I, I'd like to talk to you more about that and get those references. And sure. haven't really come across a lot of this in the literature. so. Thanks. All right, let's thank.